Then we'll be getting the expert's opinions from the chef and the winemaker as well. So strap in because it's going to be the best show we've ever had. So we'll get started. We'll let the chef introduce what's going to be going on. So Horst, take it away, buddy. Well, thank you very much for coming into Fingerbeck's Wine Food Kitchen. My name is Horst the Crazy Chef. <laughs> who came up with a brilliant idea to bring food and wine a little bit different together as you might know. There is an ongoing argument in the industry and that is the reason for this operation. Uh, in particular, uh, front of house people, customers and winemakers like to argue with us chefs about the spiciness of food. So the underlying issue is that if you have, if your taste buds are busy with garlic, chili, ginger, cracked pepper and therefore your taste buds can't read the finer end note of a good wine. However, we wanted to have flavorful food. What can we do? I have developed a five-step method of wine food cookery, as I call it. So I use garlic, chili, ginger, cracked pepper, whatever I like, but instead of putting the spices directly onto the food, I have the tendency to crush the herbs and spices with modern pestle and let them infuse into wine first. And now alcohol and acidity will drag some of the goodness out, and then quite often I reduce two or three liters of wine to one little unit like this. And now you can eventually ev imagine I have a different starting point. Rather than putting the spices directly onto the food, the aroma is dissolved in wine and will be absorbed for most of the food a little bit easier. And a little trick, you wash it with one zip of shingleback wine off your palate and your taste buds are set back to zero. Wow. Now I come to the crazy part. Uh, simple things, potatoes, pasta, rice, uh, or couscous are usually cooked in water. Steaming is done with water. I have the luxury and use plenty of shingleback wine for that. With quite interesting side effects. In particular, dry white wine, if reduced, I get pickling moments going, which you might know from kimchi or gherkins. So all of this has happened in the background music of wine food cooking. Uh, you can be almost certain that every element on your plate has seen wine or wine reduction in one way or another, even before it hits the frying pan. That is totally amazing, Blo blowing my mind. And I'm sure blowing the m mind of the listeners as well. So, John, what does that mean for the wine? Look, it's really a, a great concept in that most of my life I've been making wine and presenting it to restaurants, to sommeliers, and, and to try to match, you know, put wine that will showcase and enhance the food. And, and Horst has turned that around on its head and, and designed the food to showcase the wine. Um, and it really is sometimes, particularly things like cracked pepper and things like that, you really get those sort of spots on the palate that are quite intense pepper flavours and that can interfere with the tasting of the wine. So, so for me to have a chef that's doing everything he can to make our wines look great is really an unusual <laughs> concept. I've been, I've been sucking up to chefs all my life trying to get my wines on at restaurants and things. So thank you, Horst. But... You're very welcome. All right, so where, where are we going to start? Right. Um, there's a four-course meal prepared for you. The first course today is a Chardonnay cured Atlantic salmon, Chardonnay, sorry, rosé wine jelly, and the Atlantic salmon terrine. And you have a, a avocado and lime aioli and a fresh cucumber and dill salad. And this comes with vergine butter. Vergine is semi-ripe grape juice reduced and then incorporated into your butter. And believe it or not, also our bread is made with wine rather than water. If you try this at home, you will find a, a little bit of a problem. I was fighting with uh, yeast and uh, sourdough cultures for a bit. Uh, both of them don't like alcohol and acidity too much. So I can't do anything about the acidity in wine, but if I cook it, then I get rid of alcohol, let it cool down, and then you can make bread with wine. Uh, so this is your first course, the Chardonnay cured Atlantic salmon, uh, followed by uh, barramundi. I catch quite a large fish and have taken the neck and the tail off and have pinched the Spanish method of cookery using uh, toasted almonds, sun-dried tomatoes, and mandarins. So the flesh of the barramundi is chopped on the board first, placed in a food processor with the three aromatics uh, in order to pass them on during the cooking process. This is your barramundi. As a side dish, some broccolini, uh, some fennel salad, and some mandarin, which have been drinking Chardonnay all night. Uh, and it's kind I, of like, like, I can't get over how much wine's involved in the cooking. Keep going, sorry for Yes, no, no, I'm, I'm happy to interrupt. If you have questions, anytime. Uh, another interesting bit is black rice. Black rice One is. My favorite. Uh, yeah, it, it has become a staple with, with our fish. There are three or four variations, but the, the black rice pilaf is uh, very well known in this uh, by now. 
Uh, I came up with this idea a few years ago. This is usually uh, cook, uh, used for sweet dishes in Indonesian, Malaysian, and Japanese cuisine a lot. Not so much as savory. You can try it on the internet to find savory side dishes from black rice. Not much happened. So I cook a rice pilaf similar to the pilaf method. And a lot of people ask, oh, is there squid ink in this? I said, no, this is black rice by nature. He, he grows like this. It's really deep black. Uh, so this is your side dish for your uh, baramandi, and then a uh, little bit playful uh, chardonnay reduction and uh, um, a celery and chardonnay uh, coolies. A coolies is a sauce which is sitting between a puree and a sauce. That is why we call it coolies. So that is made from celery. This is your flavor profile for the baramandi. Uh, uh, yes, uh, and uh, sorry, the mine course, we're leaving the uh, Spanish uh, region and going to France. Uh, I decided to make another favorite in this kitchen, a duck ballotine. The duck is partly debooned and stuffed with a Shiraz and cranberry fast. As a side dish for your duck, um, caramelized vegetables, white zucchini, they are not white, but people call them white zucchini. Um, and then we go back to our favorite wine variety, which is Shiraz. So we have an apple which is not a Shiraz apple, but this is a Bravo apple, an Australian product, uh, not uh, all year round, uh, but if I run into it, I always buy them, because it, they, they have really the nice, the nice color Great for the color. Shiraz. Um, but inside, unfortunately, it looks like a normal apple. So what can I do? I let him drink sh a Shiraz all night, and then it looks like that. So the Shiraz, pickled apple, and some grapes are all a garnish for your, for your side dish. Yeah, so obviously we are an interactive show, so if you've got any questions out there, Horse has given you away some secrets. I'm pretty sure they're extremely difficult to cook, otherwise he wouldn't be giving away the secrets. But here we go. Sharon, duck with Shiraz doesn't get any better than that. John, how good is this guy? Right. He's talking to you up already. You, you know John? No. <laughs> no, I thought he might have been a friend of yours. Okay, so... Um, you seem to be giving a lot of a lot, a lot of secrets away, of course. As it, I think it must be really difficult to actually perfect what you've done. Otherwise, you wouldn't tell people. Be no, the secret well, herbs. This and is spices, one of the funny course. things in, in, in my professional life. Uh, as a young chef, if you have discovered a secret recipe, you keep it for yourself. It yeah. Sort of, it's, it's, it's yours. Uh, but I have reached a point. I, I, I really uh, be happy to to bring it out. I have nothing to hide, and everybody can can do and see. And I'm. I'm quite uh, proud of the uh, development of wine food cooking here. Excellent, and um, my favorite course, what have we got for dessert? Well, dessert is based on Shiraz, 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 and a little bit more Shiraz. Oh, so funny there's, there's that. five little elements on your dessert plate, a dark chocolate mousse with Shiraz, uh, fortified berries, a uh, ramekin with a red wine creme brulee, a Shiraz parfait, and not finished, but soon, a chocolate ganache. Wow. That's amazing. When we talk about Shiraz, we talk about dark berry and red berry flavors, and, and there they are, the berries that will go. Yes, they are. So yes. it all works together. Yes. Uh, I go half a step back to the mine course, if I may. Oh, sorry, okay, uh, so we you? have uh, left out, we have spoken about the Shiraz uh, apples and the grapes, but there's also a potato construction, which I'm quite happy with. That is a, a, a Duchesse potato and a fondant potato. Fondant potatoes are usually cooked in duck fat, and I cook them in duck fat with a, with a very heavy red wine reduction. And then I get a nice, a nice color into, into it and the taste of the, of the Shiraz. And uh, I also wanted to mention that if you cook potatoes in water, in particular the little pomparisen, as we call them, they have the tendency to fall apart, become soft. Potatoes become too soft. However, if you cook them in wine or wine reductions, if you cook them in wine or wine reductions, uh, then this potato become more stable. So the starch and the protein act with the acidity and makes it more stable. So this is the Shiraz Duchess potato and the Shiraz cabbage. It's also a part of the duck dish. With the, with the white wine reduction, you've got the acidity and things, but with red, you've also got tannin in the yes. wine. How does that affect when you bring that down to reduction? That tannin must have some effect too. Well, yes, it has, has, has. In particular, uh, for the dessert, if I reduce it too far, you get almost unpleasant notes okay. into it. You, you don't have this as much with white wine, but you, you will get this with, with red wine. Um, 
Yes. So you've got to, there's a point where you don't want to go past or the tannins get too concentrated. Yes. So. Okay. There you go. See, so I'm learning something. Well, so I guess uh, what we probably should address is how do people actually come to book in here and uh, get this amazing experience with the chef and um, your top of the range wines? So, do they book online, or do they? Um, is there a special part of the website they go to, or? But like the horse, he probably knows better than I do, but certainly they book through Cellar Door, I think there's online. Yes, we have two mind, well mind streams. You, you can call the Cellar Door people, they are happy to take your bookings. And we also with uh, Fork and a few other providers, uh, some of them have just recently caused a little hiccups, if I may say. Uh, so they, they got a new web page done uh, and the, the, the information are coming in quite rocky. However, we are in a very sweet spot here. We get a lot of regular customers. They know the cellar door number. They call the cellar door, yeah. and uh, it works quite nice. So if, you, if they're watching the show tonight and they're just drooling like I'm going to be, then they can just ring up the cellar door yes. and book themselves in? Yes. And how many do you usually do at a time? Uh, Twelve at one uh, seating. So we do uh, two seatings for the wine food chef's table, one yeah. at 11.30 for a 12 o'clock start, and then the second seating is at 1.30 for a 2 o'clock start, and in between, at one o'clock, we offer uh, seafood on the rocks table in the dining room. Right. So it's a very Sleep. personal experience. Isn't it? Yeah, it's like having your own chef. So I think that maybe um, we'll let horse get to work and we might crack the first wine. Good idea. So um, what, what, are you, I was say, what are we drinking? What are you boys going to be drinking? To start off with, the rosé. Um, tell us some tricks of the trade with the rosé. Incredibly, well, it always makes me laugh because um, these days, uh, a, a number of years ago, when we were producing a, a rosé for uh, one of our retail clients and they wanted mm -hmm. something that was uh, like the Provence rosé coming out from southern France. And, um, and I said, well, we can do better than that. We can make something with more fruit and richer and more vibrant. Um, but it did make my, my fellow winemaker, the guy Dan Hills, that works with me, an Englishman, um, has for really 15, 20 years now. Um, but um, I said, they'll come with a colour chart and they want it to be a particular colour, incredibly important for rosé, and these days it's all about that pale pink, little bit of orange through it and that sort of thing. Um, but from a winemaking point of view, rosé is all about timing. Um, we're taking red grapes and if you let them go too far where they're heading into that big red wine, you've gone, gone past that point of prettiness that we want in a rosé. So it's crucial that we get the picking where the varieties have just come up and showing really vibrant flavour. Um, often with something like Shiraz, for example, or, or Pinot, we want the, the more red fruit um, flavours and aromas rather than those darker sort of berries. Um, this rosé is a mixture of varieties um, and that gives us then more blending options, more complexity into the wine that we can get. Um, so it's, the trick is nailing that picking. It's absolutely crucial. There's only a couple of day window to get it right. A couple of days? A few days, yeah. And uh, makes a massive diff difference to how it turns out? Absolutely it does. And one of, our, one of our mains, of course, is we do get hot weather and things. And of course, if you've got nice cool weather, you get a little bit longer window if you start to get hot conditions, that window gets very complex. So our viewers love rosé. The first question we usually get every week is, do they do a rosé? So how lucky are they to be getting the winemaker explaining the finer um, process of making the rosé? That seriously is gorgeous. It's absolutely beautiful. All right, it's tell me, got to be frank give me, give me the layman's run, well, rundown, Luke. I'm a little bit worried. I feel like I'm in pretty woman here. Do I go? For, uh, these ones in? Is that the yeah, outside? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Dining okay, etiquette okay. outside. Okay. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to bugger that up. Now, with of course, with the um, with the butter that I've got here, how do I use that? How do I incorporate that? Well, your bread's coming in. Oh, that's all. Oh, okay. okay. so that'll come yeah, with the bread. That's no, with the bread, no. mate. Okay. So the wine. I'm going to steal your glass. I'm not going to drink out of it. I'm just going to have a look at it. It is very pink, isn't it? And and you said that was what you're aiming for. Just that look. Yeah. So you can imagine that with a red grape, the colour is in the skin. Yep. So we need to, um, some varieties will hand pick so that we can bring them into the winery and then separate the juice very quickly from the skins. But 
whatever we're making, it's very important that we separate that juice from the skins in the winery very quickly. So we get the fruit from the vineyard, pick it at just the right time, where we've got these lovely, bright, pretty flavors and aromas. We get it straight from the vineyard as soon as possible into the winery, into the press. We drain the juice away from the skins. Um, something like Shiraz, otherwise, we would get too much color and depth. Pinot is more forgiving, not so much color in the skin of a Pinot Noir grape. Um, so this is a combination of four different grape varieties in here, um, dominated by Pinot Noir, um, which gives lovely sort of strawberry flavors and, and a nice pale pink sort of uh, salmon color. Um, and then Shiraz, which adds in a little more structural elements, a little more um, strawberry berries, um, even a little bit of blackberry coming through and things. Tiny bit of Grenache adds a bit of spice and things to it, and then a little bit of Monastrel, Mavedra, Mataro, all the same variety, just different names. So Mavedra, and that adds a little bit of earthiness and, and some uh, um, more like forest floor and different things. So the, the last two varieties are just tweaks that add complexity. The first two varieties are the dominant sort of fruit flavors and aromas coming through. Can I can I ask a question? There? Sure. Go with, for it. With, so year in, year out, are you using the same sort of percentages in there or are you playing around every year? We play around from year to year. Sometimes each component varies and, and maybe uh, more, more, there might be a little more tannin in one than the other and things like that. So no, we do play around a little bit, but basically it's a similar sort of mix. Um, and we're sort of looking at, you know, really it's virtually um, 65, 70% Pinot Noir and about 20, 25% Shiraz and then there's just uh, um, four or five percent of Grenache and, and three or four percent of Avenger. So they really are small, those last couple of varieties. Is there a rule that goes with Rosé in terms of what you've got to have in there or can you basically... No rules. Um, it, it, look, my opinion is that it should be red grapes. Um, some people do use some white grapes in combination with red. I, I, and the nice thing in winemaking is there are no rules, right. you know, it's like we get to make them up as we go along to some extent, which is great. Um, in somewhere like Provence, which is probably the, the dominant supplier of rosé to the world market in the south of France, um, there'll be varieties like Mavendra, um, Cinso, um, all sorts of things. Um, so different varieties will work. Um, and it's really about that timing of it. So all you rosé lovers out there, I haven't seen a single question come through yet, so fire the questions through. We'll uh, let, let John get into his food, and uh, once Luke's finished his rosé almost, um, tell me who the horse talked a big game. He, well, he's it's, backed it up. That he's is, backed it up? That is outstanding. I mean, seriously, it's outstanding. Um, what, what was on the side here, this, uh, this one here? The, I'm colourblind, but I'm, I'm thinking it's whitish. The um, that, is that? Oh, this is Atlantic this salmon. Here? Atlantic yeah. salmon terrine. The terrine is a construction made out of the flesh of the uh, Atlantic salmon. That's outstanding. That's mine. And the, yeah. of all of it. And that's your winner. That's your winner of the dish. The pink. Um, that, that is, pink uh, uh, that is uh, a, a reduction of the rosé wine as a jelly. Wow, there you go. So, just a question, when, when we're um, eating this food, obviously we've got rosé here, we've got rosé in there, is that the same with all of the foods we're eating tonight? Do we, if there's rosé in the food, or if there's Shiraz in the food, are we drinking Shiraz with? Yes, we offer, we offer this exactly the same, the, that way, but I have no trouble if someone has a glass of red wine right from the beginning. Right. Because the philosophy of wine food underpins the ability to tune into the finer ends of a wine regardless. Yeah. People are here for a good time. Yeah. And if you like something specific, that's what you have. It's uh, very, very personal, isn't it? Oh, yeah, so. go, go the wine break. Yeah. This is, uh, Try and don't forget your, uh, no, no, your uh, butter uh, to go with it as well. You can't watch this because I... Um, I can't watch it. I smother it. All right, go, yeah. go for it. Okay. Well, I kind of use it like cheese. Yeah, you use it like cheese on your bread. Yeah. So, um, any questions coming through there yet, Jerry? Or any questions about the rosé or the amazing food that horses? Here we go, Tony McGuinness. Tony, great bloke, Tony. He's not the AFL footballer, Tony. It's, uh, he's even better. Local McLaren Vale guy. And um, got to get a bit of a shout out to his um, 
grandson who's over racing Speedway in uh, Poland. In Poland, wow. Number one sport in Poland Speedway. About two and a half million people watch live on YouTube. Live on YouTube. Who would have ever thought? And uh, so, Tony, are all the wines from your own grapes? <laughs> you took it away. I haven't finished. Uh, no, no. We we, um, we do um, buy in some of the fruit, um, uh, particularly a grower of mine, uh, Angelo Magliri, um, just where his vineyard is, just um, uh, just before McLaren Flat. So between McLaren Park and McLaren Flat, we take some Pinot Noir from there. We also take old bush vine Grenache that was planted in 1947. Um, wow. So that forms a part of it, and um, the Shiraz um, also from his block. So our estate, the Davy Estate, which is some 300 odd acres uh, of vines, is on more clay soils, heavier soils. And they do tend to produce great red wine with great intensity. But for rosé, the sands work really well. They naturally produce um, fruit that is a little bit lighter in colour and very pretty. So we do choose to take fruit off the deep sands in McLaren Vale for producing our rosés generally. It works really well. Yeah, well, um, I think almost every winemaker who's come on, and um, Jill mentioned it as, w as well, was, um, and um, even the guys uh, from Zontes um, mentioned that how lucky we are to, be, when you think of McLaren Vale as a region, we've got like four different areas that produce different fruit Absolutely. In, in the one little pocket. So the Selix Hill, like you said, the sand, the clay, and just being able to choose the grapes from these different areas. That's why we're so lucky we've got such amazing wine. It's one of the secrets to McLaren Vale. It's an incredibly it? diverse geology and, and soils in McLaren Vale. It's really quite amazing that you can virtually go a stone's throw and you can have a different different structure of soil or substructure under it. And that will affect how the vine grows and will affect the flavours in the, in the fruit. Yeah. Um, you know, it's the minerality of the soil and the, the geology is incredibly important. I'm not sure if I mentioned, but um, when, you, when we're talking about these wines on the show, the people who are watching are lucky enough, not as lucky as you obviously, but lucky enough to um, win a bottle that we're talking about. And Sue Valenti, do you make a sparkling Shiraz? Well, we do. It, uh, look, we, we, we originally, my brother and I, when we originally started Shingleback, we decided we would be Shiraz specialists. So making a sparkling Shiraz was a must. Yeah, um, South Australia. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and they don't get it in a lot of countries around the world, but we've persisted. We actually, we tried to get a bottle on every Thanksgiving table in the US, but we didn't quite get there. Um, and, and we find that if, if we can get it in front of people, they just love it. And the same in China, you know, when I can pour sparkling shrouds in China, they love it. But it's very hard to explain without putting it in a glass for somebody. Yeah. A um, lot of fun. I always talk about sparkling shiraz is the, the wine that's going to get you up and dancing. Yeah, uh, and dad asleep on the couch by <laughs> four in the afternoon on Christmas Day, but that's all good. So, you know. so um, black bubbles. That's black the, bubbles. That's the, black the bubbles. sparkling shirts. Yes. So Shane Lester, how long does the rosé mature before optimal drinking flavours? Great question, buddy. Great question. Uh, I'll let you answer that, but you got no idea. So we'll no. let the water make it. <laughs> Look, it, it, it's I guess. Well, now that we're making these very modern styled rosés, dry rosés, they will actually age quite well. Um, originally, many years ago, we made rosés that were much sweeter and uh, more lolly sort of things, and, and they weren't really that good with food. They were kind of quaffers on a summer day and that sort of thing. But these dry style, and this is a dry wine. It's not relying yeah, on any sweetness. You know, it's, it's all fruit that comes through. So this is the 19 vintage now. We do obviously with rosé, we want it out reasonably early and bright, but I think these wines will stand up for a number of years. Um, you know, you're not going to leave it for more than four or five years sort of thing, but two or three years these wines will be drinking beautifully. And we'll find out, we'll find out how long they'll so, last. Um, so, in other words, buy a couple of bottles? Yeah, put, look, drink, drink one now and put one away for a couple absolutely. of years? Absolutely. Look, it's not something you put in the cellar, but, no. um, um, but don't be scared. With wine like this, it's, it's looking great now. It's still mm. bright and pretty and fresh, and, and it's going to live for, you know, be lively for several more years. Um, you know, really, you've got those sort of citrus characters that come through on the nose yeah. as well as that nice red berry fruit and strawberry. And that Do you think, is, is this a wine that we're doing a lot better recently? Because I think I, so, yeah. 
you know, some, some of the rosés I've tasted recently have just, in the Barren Vale, have been amazing. And I was never a rosé drinker. But that there, that yeah. was, that's spot I on. think we, we talk about we're now making serious rosés. I think that's possibly an oxymoron in terms, yeah. but because rosés are supposed to be fun. But these dry rosés are really purpose-made. Yeah. Um, you know, in the old days, they used to make rosé by running off a bit of juice from the red wine to concentrate it. And they weren't, they were picked as reds and they were always too tough or too alcoholic and that sort of thing. Very important the alcohol here too. This is about 12%, just under maybe 11, right. 8. And that helps with the freshness. We want this to be easy yeah. to drink. We want it to match up with more delicate foods. And, but it will go through to even more spicy Asian sort of things. Um, so you want it to be refreshing in the palate. That's exactly. If someone asked me what that was, I'd say it's refreshing, it's fresh, it's just, yeah. Yeah, and uh, when horse out did himself that that bread and the butter I've never tasted butter like that ever in my life it's well, uh, then you never had water uh, uh, bread and butter with wine in it no no that was outstanding yeah, it makes a difference. Yeah. I can imagine that's quite hard with the trying to get the yeast to do its job and everything it, yes. um, um, obviously we, you know we we know that um, well I know a lot about yeast that's what we do with wine it's all about fermenting grapes but um, thank you it's all right so um, I think you're the luckiest guy on the mid coast at the moment. Yeah, no, I'm pretty sure I am at the moment. Yeah, no, I'll so. be reminding you when I need to go on a tour. <laughs> um, so I, I think that we have been extre extremely lucky, and I don't know how he's going to outdo himself, of course, the second course, but we'll, we'll have to. Are we almost ready for the, the second course? Yes, I am. Yeah? Oh, hang on. We got, we got last week's superstar, mm. Brett Doonan. How has COVID changed your wine sales? More direct to customer out of the cellar door. Like, did he answer his own question for you? Or? Um, a little bit, but look, we've been. I guess we Shingleback does sell a lot through major retail, um, yeah. as well as direct to customers and things. So, the major retail, the sort of big box thing, has been quite good. Um, has been, um, um, in fact, you know, at a price point, particularly wines are really moving fast. Um, it generally tends to be that sweeter spot, that sort of uh, 10 to $25 wines, the higher priced wines are moving a little bit slower. Um, we have had great support from our ambassadors, from our regular customers who have been buying a lot of wine from us direct. Um, so it's carried on pretty well. Um, we are not as strong in on-premise in restaurants as I'd like to be, but that's turned out to be be in this time not such a bad thing because obviously with the restaurants closed those that were relying on that market solely have really hurt so look, we've been one of the lucky companies um, we've we, in fact we I think um, <laughs> much to some of my staff's annoyance we we are in a position where we couldn't even go to the government and and get the uh, job keeper um, money and things like that because our business is still ticking along pretty well well, that's um, a good thing. Mm. So, um, oh, I think I'm going to have to leave and leave you with it. Thank you very much for giving me another sort of moment of attention. Yeah. I would like to play up the Baramandi starting with the, uh, with the, the celery arc in Chardonnay the Puli, which is the sauce. And then a bit of colour contrast, the black rice. How good is this? There's only eight elements. Only eight elements? Eight. Yeah. I don't think. Mandarin. The mandarin. That's been drinking Chardonnay? That's the one. Yeah. So and I was paying attention. And some secret herbs and spices. And some broccolini. And then we have a bit of basil oil. Fennel and Chardonnay salad. Fennel and Chardonnay and salad. Try to deliver a little bit more Chardonnay as a Chardonnay and citrus reduction. And then we have the Spanish inspired barramani with toasted almonds. Wow. <laughs> Standard. 
I love the way the acidity works with these salad elements in it. Um, <laughs> that was the most difficult thing I've done for a long time. Bon appetit, please enjoy. Yeah. Thank you. Ah. Wow, so the, that looks sensational. That is sensational. Can you see that one there? Yeah. We got a good, we got a good shot of the food there, Jerry. That is something else. This is one of my favourites, and I do love this rice. It's just something. Something special, and said you only usually see it in sweet dishes. In, yes, in mine, things, so yeah. it just works so well with the savoury. Have you, think, you've had black rice before? Yes, and I love it. So you lived in Japan for yeah, a few it. years, didn't you? Love it, love it, love it. In Mexican, a lot of time. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but that's um, you, you kind of don't want to eat it. It's so it, that's a piece of art there, isn't it? So um, just so the show doesn't just become a food show, I think we should probably maybe pour some wine because I think horse has actually taken over. These dishes that. Well, we it's almost oh, a wine. Right. No, nah, we don't do that in COVID. We'll put that one on the tray. Yep. It's mine. Doesn't matter. We've got someone commented on it on one, of, on one of the other ones. Okay. So we won't do that. No. So what are, what are, what are we actually drinking with it? Obviously, I'll, I'll take a guess and say Chardonnay because of the Mandarin. But. Um, that's right. So, yep. the, uh, red knot chardonnay. <clears throat> this is a state fruit, so grown on the estate, which uh, is just south of us here. If you kept going down the Victor Victor Road, you'd actually drive through the middle of our vineyards, um, just a couple of k's south. Um, and um, I, I guess chardonnay is one of those things. I, I when I started my career, chardonnay was the grape. It was the exciting thing. It was several thousand dollars a ton, and um, so some of my first years were trying to make Chardonnay. It's a relatively new variety in, the, in Australia in that it's really only been significant quantities in the last sort of 30, 40 years. Um, and it was only through the 80s, 90s that a lot of Chardonnay was planted. So we learned a lot about it in the 80s. And to be honest, we made some goddamned awful ones. They were, <laughs> they were, uh, they were over oaked and over skin contacted and, and they looked good for a year or two in that uh, they were sort of up front, but they were a bit dolly part and ended up on their face after a year or so and, and, uh, and things. So one of my great desires um, as a young winemaker was to make Chardonnay that would live and would last. Yep. When I was working uh, in the district to our north, which I shan't name, that likes to think they're the best wine district in Australia, but um, um, oh, we, we used to take those Barossas, Barossans, we used to take fruit out of McLaren Vale Chardonnay and that had a really rich mid palate. We'd also take fruit out of the Adelaide Hills and that was more uh, steely and refined and, and nice acid. Um, but we get a generosity to McLaren Vale Chardonnay. Part of this is the colour, you know, you look at this and, and it's got that nice golden but there's green tints coming yeah, through. Yeah, I, so I was just about to say still really youthful in its appearance. And that's incredibly important. So, um, what year? Year is it? 2019. 2019. Yeah. So, we generally um, will bottle these towards the end of the year that they're made. So they will sit on. Uh, so first of all, with this, we take it out of the vineyard. We just pick it. There's no additions made, no sulfur oxide, anything like that. It just comes into the winery. No enzyme. It's purely put into the press. The juice drained away. Naturally settled. All we do is add yeast. And, um, and then we leave the wine on yeast lees for some time. Um, so just we don't clean it up, it's left on the yeast lees. A little bit of malolactic ferment, which is a secondary bacterial ferment, which gives some nice creamy sort of characters to the wine. And then eventually we put it all together and, and get it ready for bottling. But it's, it's very important it stays on those lees. It keeps it very fresh means we don't have to use sulfur dioxide and various things in the wine to any great extent. Um, but it, uh, we're looking for those, you know, here we're always going to get some of those stone fruit characters. Yeah, in the that's what I smell straight away. Um, you know, whereas perhaps from the Adelaide Hills it might be more citrus and floral and those sorts of things. So we will get a, a sort of slightly richer style of Chardonnay. Um, I've got to remind the uh, viewers that um we are open for questions, even though Luke and John are trying to eat and drink at the same time. But um, I can ask, I can answer your questions. Eat, drink, and talk. Well, <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about, but I'll answer it anyway. So uh, I, I know a lot about Chardonnay. I know the Crow supporters used to drink it. 
They're probably not drinking as much this year as they would have usually. <laughs> Chardonnay sales are down. That's right. Because um, the Crows supporters are... Yes, yeah, so I was waiting for that. Oh, you're going for the Crows, Luke. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Incredibly important. My wife Kate's favourite tuple is Chardonnay. So oh. it's, uh, and we, uh, we did make a wine called Kiss Me Kate a Chardonnay out of the Adelaide Hills, which um, is a great shame in that the vineyard... I was going to take that fruit um, this year, but that vineyard burned in the Woodside, in the fires up at Woodside. So I don't think we've mentioned much sad. about that on the on the show. And um, it was a lot of, of vines were lost, and a lot of wineries were hurt by. But the smoke damage as well caused a lot of a lot of um, I guess this year's crop not to be be able to be used at all. Yeah. Um, such a shame. And I guess if anybody's out there and um, wants to support any of these wineries that are affected. Buy some of their wine. Do something for them. Like we might even throw it out there to um, people that were affected. If they want to come on the show, come on the show and uh, come down and see us. Bring your wine down, and we're happy to put you on the show and uh, give you some uh, advertising and hopefully boost their sales a little bit because that is the wine industry. Everybody's out to help each other, aren't they? Very much so. So um, if there is anything we can do for any of the wineries that are affected, let us know. Um, if they're not watching and you are and you know some of them, then um, by all means, flick us an email, catch us on Facebook, send us a message, and we'll do anything we can to help out any of those wineries. That goes for you guys on KI too. We shouldn't really forget about that. No. So, um, horrible, horrible summer, wasn't the it? The smoke effects are, um, you know, it's, if the smoke is coming from a distance, it, it actually sort of breaks down quite quickly the compounds that affect the grapes. It gets absorbed through the skins of the berries. Um, so it's only those vineyards that are quite close to the fire that really get affected generally. Um, obviously, if the fire's there, then there's damage from other things. But it is a great shame in that there's some great vineyards that did, didn't miss the fires, but of course they were so close to the smoke that they were yeah. affected. Now, those vineyards will not be affected next year. It's only a one-year thing. It's not in the woods. So their next year fruit will be, there'll be no issues. Um, and you've got to remember the Adelaide Hills too, and is a huge area. And so, so there was only a section of the Adelaide Hills affected. So people have to remember that many wineries weren't affected. So, so please don't don't tar the, uh, the the grapes with one brush and things. In that, uh, you know, it's very diverse our grape growing things, and there was only restricted areas affected by the smoke. Yeah, that's a really good point. No effect here. Um, we did testing just to make sure because we had some smoke blow over from. Kangaroo Island to here, but there was no effect whatsoever. Excellent. Um, questions, questions, live, interactive, no I've, questions? I've got a question. Luke's got a question. Got a question. You might win a bottle of wine, mate. <laughs> Fantastic. Horse, the broccoli, uh, the broccolini, I should say, how did you cook it? I just steam it with a little bit of Chardonnay. Chardonnay. Right, because that broccolini with Chardonnay is, that's, that was magic. It's just a hot frying pan, broccolini goes in, a little dash of, of Chardonnay uh, and, a, and a little bit of olive oil. And that changes it completely and it's, and it's just a hint, there's just something in there and I was like, oh, what was that? That acidity from the wine really seems to work with the vegetables and things. Right. It seems to almost fix the colour and the, and the vibrancy of them yes. and, and the flavours. So. Well, that, um, that orange, mandarin? Just, oh, mandarin, sorry, that works so well. It is really playful to use so much wine here. It is really opposite from what I have known from my previous business life. Mm -hmm. In the kitchen, you're always under a kind of financial pressure, right. and you try not to use too much wine. So if you if you have two bottles of wine and make a sauce out of it, it costs you $25. For $25, you can buy, say, a kilo of pork fillet, make yep. five portions out of it, have $150 in return. If, it's, if you make a wine uh, sauce, then you have nothing to sell. That's right. Normally, normally the wine that goes to the kitchen gets drunk by the chefs, not, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. not put in no the food. Yeah. You know, that's right. But, but so, it's a luxury of using uh, quite a bit of wine uh, in, in an unusual way. And I have I have learned and readjusted and fine tuned so many recipes. And I thought even even a simple thing like like a braised sort of secondary cut like a shoulder or, or a lamb shanks, you usually have say half a liter of wine uh, of, or even just a glass of wine in your sauce. I reduce wine before it goes into the sauce to get even more in. And I thought there must be a breaking point. On one stage I had made a test drive and reduced about six liters of wine to a liter and said I, I pour it to my uh, brace and see how it goes. It's still fine. 
Yeah, right. The only the breaking point is only in the acidity and tannin. If you have too much, then it sort of uh, uh, falls over. But not too soon. So don't be don't be scared using a lot of wine in your sauce. Okay. How, how good is it having an expert there just to yeah, answer amazing. your question for you, um, Shane Lester? What percentage of sales is Chardonnay? Okay. And what has he got? Being a conscientious choice. Oh, he's a winner too. He's won himself a bottle. He might be able to cook some broccolini with and uh, you, you use a little bit of it with a broccolini. That'd be your advice. Mm. Yeah. That's about the best fish meal I've ever eaten. Oh. So you're looking at Chardonnay. I mean, it was a thing going on for a while with anything but bloody Chardonnay, you know. And um, and that really upset me in that it's a great wine. I used to always say another beautiful Chardonnay, ABC. Um, Chardonnay is one of those varieties that. Um, it's, it's, it's not just about the vineyard and, and the vines, there's also a lot of winemaker influence that comes into it. And I guess that's why as winemakers we do love it, in that it's about how you handle on the leaves, it's about oak. It's one of those whites that we do like to put a little bit of oak on and things and, and some to barrel. So it's a little different to something like a Riesling, which is just a pure expression of the grapes and as pure as possible is what you want. With Chardonnay we try to over layer with, with layers of complexity that come from the, the winemaking process as well. Yeast we choose, all sorts of things. Um, as a percentage of sales, quite small. Look, McLaren Vale is known for Shiraz, yeah. for Cabernet, for Grenache and that primarily these days, although it used to have a great reputation with Chardonnay, but it's true that the Adelaide Hills and, and Margaret River and Yarra Valley and things have really made Chardonnay their stick, if you like, and, and so they've taken over as perhaps being the lead in sales there. Um, and uh, about five percent of our business, that's all sort of thing. So. As what what would you say was the best Chardonnay producing place in the world? Uh, look, the reality is Burgundy still makes some pretty bloody good wines, and and although you know, I, obviously I'm, I'm I love this country in Australia, but we've learned a lot from the French, and and I I still can't go past a good Chablis or a Burgundy at times. Margaret River's doing some magic things. Yeah. Look, thank you. Um, and you reckon Margaret River's climbing yeah, look, up there? It's really it? interesting. I, I've got a, a girl that I did um, winemaking with, uh, Virginia Wilcox, who's Vass Felix winemaker, and, and she's doing some stunning things there. Um, Yarra, you know, some of the places like Oak Ridge in the Yarra are doing some great things. New Zealand's doing some really special things with Chardonnay now too. So Chardonnay does like that slightly cooler climate. McLaren Vale is probably at the warmer end for Chardonnay. Yeah. But I think as you see here, we're getting something that's still pretty pristine and you look at that colour, it's still fresh and bright and, 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 very, uh, and very easy. Plus you're getting something, you know, look if you buy a uh, Fats Felix or a, something like that, you're going to be paying maybe 50 bucks a bottle. Um, Red Knot Chardonnay here is recommended retail of $14.95 and you know, on special at $11, $12, so you really can't go too wrong with that. Yeah. Um, you can probably get four bottles of Red Knot for, for one Yarra Valley Chardonnay, so you can do your value equations and things there and stuff. So, Luke, you haven't told me much about the wine. You haven't told me Luke's version of the wine. I, what, what yeah, you, it's, it's funny, I'm not a Chardonnay drinker, um, but I could, and, and pairing it with the food there, with the fish, that was delicious. I mean, I, I would happily sit down with a group of friends and if that was put on the table with some fish, yeah. it just works so well together. It did, but you've got to, got, to, got to remember too, the horse is playing tricks with you. He's cooking the food in the wine as well, remember? Yeah. Which is making the wine yeah. and John's wine making ability seem exceptional. And, you not know, that it might not be, but... You talk about the Chardonnay, and Chardonnay in the 80s, 90s here was bloody awful. So I think I'm still trying to get over the 90s. Um, some, right. some people want to push it back to yeah, that style, but I refuse to do it. I think, <laughs> we're, I think we're getting it pretty right these days. Yeah, so. that's that's a whole different beast. And that's, for 12 bucks a bottle. And you've got to remember that Chardonnay... Uh, it, it's recommended retail fourteen ninety five, but you get to pick this up and store it at eleven twelve dollars sort of thing. So, yeah. um, so great value. This rosé is also just around that fifteen dollars mark too. So they're extraordinary good value wines. The amount of effort that goes into yeah, it, well, I, was, uh, I was about to say uh, that state for you know your big wine are, making. Yeah, so. that's. I mean the Red Knot um, Shiraz, for instance. Um, that's in my mind the best value for money red yeah. wine that you can buy out there. Yeah, and I, it's, it gets up and wins gold medals in wine shows and beats yeah. wines at five, ten times the price of things yeah. quite often. Um, and we do pride ourselves on that. Um, we, we, you know, the wine business is still that pyramid 
and obviously what we would all like is a really pointy pyramid with a narrow base and lots up at the higher price end. But that's not reality for the market. The reality is, you know, you need a good solid base of value wine that people can drink every day. And then we produce wines above that that become special occasion or or wines that you want to impress your father and daughter be or that sort of yeah. thing, you know. So I call those my ego wines at the very top because they, they make me feel good about myself yeah. when I win awards. But, um, but we do pride ourselves on delivering value at every price point we do. Well, going around and talking to winemakers, and when we talk about the different wines, the Red Knot Shiraz is always spoken about. Always spoken about as, as, as an entry level, it's crazy how good it is. And it's been incredibly important to our business through yeah. these tough times in that that's what people, that's the go-to wine at the moment is the Red Knot Shiraz and Cabernet for a lot of people sitting at home. So. We've got a few international um, viewers that watch every week and um, they would be absolutely blown away. I've tried to get a couple to come over on holiday and go on Luke's tour. Uh, they were talking to that and they were saying uh, once they're allowed to travel they're coming over and um, no doubt you bring them to Shingleback. After watching this they're going to have to come and meet horse as well, aren't they? Well, for, yeah. for the um, dinner, yeah. but the amount, how lucky we are, is uh, it blows me away. Like people say, oh, you never ever complain about a bad wine on the show. I don't think there's such a thing in McLaren Vale. It's just variants of good oh, yeah. because we are so lucky in where we live and how good the wine industry is. Not bagging the Barossa or the Coonawarra or any of the other places, but we are very lucky in, we and did. the price point of our wine is. Like some people in the industry, um, Joe Sabella, for instance, would tell you his wine's too cheap, far too cheap. Should be right up there with the, the rest of the expensive wines. And Drink, he's probably not drinkers right. Drinkers out there get great value in this country. Yeah, it's don't they? Really exceptional value. So, um, no, you're right. Look, it, it's um, um, we're very privileged in this country in that we have you know a great clean environment. Um, we've got the land to grow the produce. Food here is phenomenal. Yeah. Really, um, you know, I often think sometimes I, I think curries are better here than in, in overseas and things because the ingredients come in the same often with Chinese food and things. Chinese food here can be just outstanding because of the freshness and the quality of the ingredients that are going in. Um, so we're very privileged. We and we're farmers. Um, you know, my family, my great great grandfather and through my grandfather, they were growing tomatoes and vegetables here. They used to get the first tomatoes to Melbourne for Melbourne Cup and make good money. Um, so I come from a long line of, of dirt scratches and, and we, we're pretty proud of, of what we do. You know, the original part of our estate here was my grandfather's land, was part of a dairy farm. And uh, my brother and I were lucky enough to, to take over that um, when my grandfather was still alive and he got to see the first grapes that we grew and produced, which I'm very proud of. Um, but, and we also still run, uh, we run beef in a farm up in the hills, so we're still producing other things. Um, I'm very proud of that too. Uh, so we're very lucky. If, if, everything goes, if everything goes really bad, I've got wine, I've got beef, I've got a veggie garden, it's all good. <laughs> you'll, you'll, be, you'll be fine, mate. Just bring a horse right. along for the ride. That's right. We've got horse and we've got horse. We've got to try it. He's allowed to go home. It's just saying, it's good fun to be and cook for you. So, um, locations and contacts with Shingleback Tasting Room. Um, three Stump Hill Road, McLaren Vale. For people who don't know the Vale that well, first left as you come in to the McLaren Vale. Um, that, that's got to be an advantage too, doesn't it? The first winery as you come in. Sure. Yeah, and um, everybody knows where it is. Like look, with Luke, when he brings his tours through, he said he, he comes along on the e-bikes up the path and he can smell it. I can yeah. smell the smoke coming out of the chimney. Chimney there. Just last week I was bringing a group along, and fortunately they were kids and their dad, so they, we weren't going to wine this, but they smelt it from about 400 metres away. And I said, that's Shinkleback. And um, I, I kind of wanted the dad to go, well, why don't, why don't we stop in? But, Fair, fair that's enough. great. We get a lot of guys coming in, people coming off the bike bike path. Yeah, it's and, in a uh, great location and, and dropping in. So, and it is. Look, we've got a lovely old historic barn on the vineyard, which is a party venue these days. It's sort of done up and can see about forty people, and great for a great for a country party. But, and we, when we first started, we thought about turning that into a cellar door, but we had the opportunity to purchase this here. Um, and the reality is you lose all the red BMWs and Mercedes Benz when they hit the dirt road. So, so here we, you know, we, we we're, a new, we're the new kids on the block. We've only been around for sort of 20 odd years, 20 years, 25 years. So um, 
So we're not that 100 year brand like Darrenberg and that sort of thing. So for us to be visible at the front of McLaren Vale, it's very important for people yeah. to get to know us and learn about us. And um, like Horst said before, if you are wanting to book, after you see the rest of the food that gets delivered tonight, if you do want to book, give them a call in the cellar door. A few issues with the internet at the moment, so give them a call and uh, book in through the cellar door, or even better, come for a drive down, visit some other wineries while you're here, drop in, taste the wine, book yourself in while you're here. 40 minutes from the city and you're in beautiful McLaren Vale. If you've had enough wine tasting, go down to the beach of Port Wollonga, go for a nice walk, just a, just a great spot. Yeah, we're extremely lucky. God's country, we call it, don't yep. we? Yep. So, so as you come across that bridge at Port Wollonga, God's country. And uh, we've got e everything to offer. So much wine, we don't use water anymore. No, 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 no. It's funny you should say coming across that bridge. That's the way I feel. Once you come across that bridge at Port Lunga, yeah. Gosh, country, we're there. Might have been for when we were on the school bus, I reckon. 741? <laughs> yeah, come on. 45, 45. yeah. So, um, any more questions for John while well, you've got um, a winemaker here? Make the most of it. And if you've got any questions for Horse also, um, fire him away. Um, he's slaving away. He'll be back in a minute to answer any questions if you've got any. So, um, we, you got another question for us? No, him? I'm yeah. just smelling it. Oh, you're just having not. That's amazing. I reckon we might be ready. Are you ready? Uh, one minute. One, one minute. minute. Okay. Good so we'll have to, we have to fill it. We we'll have to fill a minute. So can you just get rid of that for me? Because I'm yeah, too tempted right. to drink it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, it smells great. I, I can't believe the price. Uh, yeah, that's crazy. Uh, and, and I agree, but yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you do. <laughs> Put it up, he said. Well, yeah. My, yeah. my CEO was actually my bank manager many years ago and um, the shingleback, so I think he agrees too. But um, look, it's a competitive game we're in, yeah, and yeah. you know you really can find great value out there. That, so. that rosé, in particular, I. Well, I'm glad because we, we really pride ourselves on this and we when we create first created this, I think about five years ago, this dry rosé style we're doing, we picked up a trophy the first year and I think we've won about two or three trophies with it over the years. Um, a good so, so we seem to have hit a style that people like. Um, we got, we got a question from um, C. Valenti. Often I need white wine for risotto. I guess the Chardonnay would be perfect. Absolutely, yeah, no, it'll work really well. And particularly this Red Knot Chardonnay, there's not too much oak in it, there's really just a splash of oak to, there's like a little drop of vanilla and cream to bring up the flavour of the cream. Yep. So you probably wouldn't want to use an oaky Chardonnay or something like that um, in your risotto, it might be a little bit too dominating, but this would work really well. And um, the little bit that you used in the, in the risotto, the rest of it will go down beautifully while you're eating it. Well, it is, one for the, one for the pot, one for the cook. Is that table you, we got John, thanks for watching John, is that table you're sitting at available for bookings? Right, you must be coming in and out, well, I'll go through it again John, um, yes it's available for bookings, they se seat up to 12. I'm wondering if he's thinking do you sit in here? Oh, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. 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 It, it's yeah. part of the experience yeah. that there's, there's two tables in here usually of six. Well, normally, six Corona but, too, but we had uh, three tables, uh, yeah. they'll be going back to this very soon. Uh, and any number between 2 and 12 fits in quite mm. nicely. So no, you get this experience of watching the cooking happening, yeah. of, of smelling the aromas before the food comes out. And Horst is very chatty, so he likes to, likes to tell people how and, things uh, are done. We, and another so. question from Shane. He's been throwing up some pretty good questions. He must be due to win a bottle, I think. Well, he might have already won one. How long well. has Chef been in charge of the wine-infused food? All right, food and wine cooking is ongoing forever, but I have intensified this here in the last four years. So I started four years ago with a simple idea to bring people into the kitchen and cook with wine. Yeah. And then it has all developed from, from there. We had this kitchen here, and fabulous kitchen, um, and Horst really brought us the concept, and. And I really enjoyed the first time Horst sat us down and he cooked the food for us and we were blown away. And, and my brother, who's much smarter than I am, he, he made sure that Horst uh, made this his home and we've been, we've been very lucky. Not only is it great for our customers and the experience they can have, but within our business when we have people from China or, or um, people that are buying wine, it, it's, we're so proud to be able to sit them here and have horse specially cooked for them, cook something special. It really helps us sell our booze. So yeah, it's, well, it's a yeah. good thing. He was, he was talking up saying he made a taste better. So. 
Of course you would, you would love it, wouldn't you? Th those tastes, I mean, that, that bread, I've never eaten bread that tastes anywhere near that. It's just so, and the butter that goes with it, it's just, it right, just challenges. Right, you're, you're, up, you're up for a room. Oh, All right, right. All right take, take it away, chef. Yes, I'm all yours. Yeah. And the food is all yours in a minute. Not yours. <laughs> Mine. We might swap these out. Yeah, get rid of those. You got some more glasses over there? We have. Not a problem there. So here's your Shiraz Duchess potato and the kind of nice zucchini and carrots. The carrots uh, have not Shiraz in it, but white wine and a bit okay. of cinnamon. Mm. Cinnamon is a background note also in the Shiraz, the Shiraz cabbage. Just the colour of it, it's great. And, and it? I need the Shiraz cabbage only to hold the duck legs in, in, in place. But I often the duck legs fall over and then I came up with the idea, I put a little bit of Shiraz cabbage. So that's a little trick. And, and then I plant it in here. Yeah. And then yeah. usually, except if the camera is running, then it falls over anyway. But it is a starting point of the Shiraz cabbage, and then we had our bravo apples, which have been drinking Shiraz. Sorry, was that, was that, they were, that was that apple that you had earlier. That yes. was an amazing yes. looking apple. The color was great. Yeah, what so co I'm color blind. What color was it? It was almost a sort of burgundy dark, yeah, it was almost a real dark red wine insane. sort of color to that. So. And then to create really happiness with the duck leg. With a little bit of the sauce. Sorry, I've been watching too much Master Chef lately. <laughs> <laughs> My wife loves it, so I get to. Uh... <laughs> so you get to watch it. People, 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 right. people have definitely developed a professional language. Uh, well, that's right. I, I, we all know what sous vide is now. Which yeah, I'm not yeah, sure that's a good thing, but yeah, still. Everybody's <laughs> talking about layers of flavour and construction and dust and foam and whatnot. Uh, but here you have it, your Shiraz duck balotine. Please enjoy. Outstanding. Oh, that smells fantastic. And I think we're matching with that a little D block Shiraz. All right, well, why don't you give that to me? I'll do that okay, for you thank too you. while you guys get into the food. And then we can we can talk about. Have we got grapes down the end here? Yes, yes, grapes there as well as the um, grapes, yeah. Apple down the center. Oh, that's that's sour and that's a kini. That looks amazing. That'll be yours. Thank you. Okay. You're not driving, so you no, you're mean, driving me or not. You're driving. Thank you, mate. I we are. I'm the duty driver all of a sudden. Look at that. Wow. I'm just going to pour a little bit so I can talk about it while you guys are eating. Look at that, the duck just falls apart. All right, now we can't have we can't have silence. No. You can't just you know, can't come on the show and just eat the whole way through. No. Right. Like, you're going to tell me. Forgotten we're supposed <laughs> to be talking to people. You got to tell me what we're actually. Well, I'm just wondering, I mean, I've just got a question about the menu. Do okay. You, how often do you change the menu? Is I it... have no idea what I do next weekend. Wow. It, it, is, it is not like in a restaurant. You have to mind time and a la carte menu, which is usually printed. Yeah. And then you go shopping to fill all the gaps on your menu. That you mind time, duck or barramundi, whatever is printed on the menu. Yeah. And then you're also tempted to buy uh, things which you need only for the purpose of being there. But I go shopping not with the shopping list, but with the number of people booked for the weekend yeah. and buy food for a number of people and make food out of it. That's awesome. That's that's cool. That that's is cool. awesome. So um, the d -bop, very well known um, shingleback wine, um, covered in gold medals. Just having a, uh, having a look in here, you couldn't fit many more. You actually have to lap around the bottle almost. We've, we've had a few where we've had to do that. Yeah. We've decided that, um, so this is a 2016, and obviously the D box of the reserve. Yes. Um, One of the wines up that pointy end of that pyramid, and um, and it's certainly been good for my ego over the years. We've won some pretty major trophies with both the Shiraz and the Cabernet. Um, winning in Jimmy Watson in 2006 with the Cabernet. Um, and, um, and this has just constantly done well. Um, 16 is the current vintage, um, which is nice. We want this to have, we generally don't release these until three years of age or so, so they yep. just need a bit of time to settle down. Now this is a proposition, when you talk about how long things will age, this really is a, that's a difficult question. Particularly now we're using screw caps on these and things, they really will stay fresh and bright for a long time. 
Um, but this, um, you know, Shiraz, I guess it's at the heart of McLaren Vale. Um, we've made it our stick. Um, the estate vineyards, some 60% of the vineyards are Shiraz, something and similar amount of the district is Shiraz, about half the fruit in the district is Shiraz that's grown. Um, look, at it once, when I first started winemaking, Cabernet was the king of grapes and Shiraz was kind of the workhorse. But, uh, but the, uh, there was a little bit of a coup there and Shiraz certainly nowadays is, is you know, what Australia is known for around the world. Um, and I love to think it's a bit like Australians because whereas Cabernet is quite collar and tie and a bit tight and structured and things, Shiraz is unashamedly big and bold and slurpy and, and uh, all those things. It's the open neck tennis shirt guy at the party who's cracking jokes and the girls are paying a fair bit of attention, you know. That's um, crazy, very so, much. But, um, um, so look, yeah, these wines, and, and they do do well. We, one thing with Shingleback is, because we're only sort of a 25-year-old company, um, we, we do put our wines into shows constantly. We want yeah. to put them out there. We, we're happy to take the criticism. They don't always win things, but generally we do very well. And, and it does get us, um, you know, it does get our wine in front of a lot of people that maybe we wouldn't. And I think a lot of wine writers discovered us through the show system and things where they might be judging and they think, who are these guys that keep winning gold medals in the classes I'm judging? Better give them a write-up. And, and for us, that's, that's our lifeblood to get, to get here on this program or to get a wine write-up and things is what we need to get our message out to people and so people what, come what and experience What was your first it. big award you won? I mean, it must have been a pretty special, no matter sort of... Well, I, I, the very first one was a gold medal for... Um, for a Shiraz, uh, 98 Shiraz going back, which was the first wine we released uh, under our Shingleback label. Uh, and that was in Hobart, and I was pretty proud because we'd only made uh, three barrels or four barrels of wine, which is a little different now. We make, uh, we make about 140,000 dozen a year or 130,000 dozen. So, yeah, so yeah, a little bit different. A little bit different, but, um, but very proud of that start. Um, we picked up in said, the 05 Cabernet, picked up the Jimmy Watson, and for any winemaker, that's a that's a bit of fun. Mm. Um, I, I did like uh, I, my, one of my, my favourite winery here in McLaren, of course, Darren Berg, and, and Chester is a great guy and he's a long term friend, but he was giving me a bit of stick about the Jimmy Watson trophy. And, and Darry leant over and he said, Yeah, yeah, he said, but, but you know what? I've got one and John's got one and you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> and I still, uh, thank you, Darry, that was great. And, and Darry won one back in the 60s for, for a Cabernet again. So, mm -hmm. so uh, has, has Chester won one yet? Sorry? Has Chester won one yet? No, no. no, he, no. he says it's not. It doesn't matter. It's all doesn't good. matter? <laughs> <laughs> Look, they make fabulous wine. I think he's doing it. Okay. So he absolutely is. So um, you better hop, don't want to offend horse and hop into the um, amazing meal he's prepared. Um, questions? Fire some questions away. d -bot Shiraz. One of my favourite Shirazes. I won't, I won't drink it, I'll just sit here and draw over it while I watch you eat yeah, the That's big and ballsy. It just yeah. works so well. But it, it, the colour of it, you've, I've seen darker. Yeah. Darker Shirazes, but it's bold when you drink it, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, what's it like with the, inf the Shiraz infused meal? You know what? Every, every meal there seems to be an element on there that really stands out for me. Yeah, that, what is it this one? The apple. The apple. The apple. That's magnificent. That's why you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. That's why you're talking about. That's what if you have a simple product and you turn it into something else, then yeah. it becomes amazing. Otherwise, it's just an apple. You just eat it and you go, there's just so much going on with that. And, that, and it works so well with all the other elements. That's, uh, that's magic. So all you've got to do is uh, throw a question up to win a bottle of uh, D-Block. That's probably the best best deal, deal yet, isn't it? Is there anyone in my family watching? <laughs> 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 question in, if you could. I think there's a rule in there somewhere. No, oh, oh, no, it's all right. Change your name. No, like guidelines. There's not that rule, otherwise uh, my brother would never win. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, look, it, it's like, like the food. You drink with your eyes first, so the mm. colour's incredibly important. But as yeah. you said, we could make this bigger. That wouldn't necessarily make it better, though. It is, yeah. You know, like like this dish where there's perfect balance between the elements. The wine has to be the same thing, and and um, it's probably one of the things I think over the last particularly ten or fifteen years we we we're a little bit more careful. We don't tend to work things as hard. We the oak is backed off. The oak is really should just be a fine frame that highlights Everybody and shows the fruit. Everybody's backing off a little bit with their oak. 
Yeah, I think so. And the only people sad about that are the oak salesmen, of course. But um, um, have that done, done a right over the last few days. And look, it's still incredibly important. Don't get me wrong, because we run, we run. 1,400 barrels or 14, something like that, or 1,500 or so. And um, what we do is we buy, these days, we really buy the best oak we can, and then we use it for a longer period of time. We keep it in very good condition. Probably the best fill of my oak is often years three through five sort, sort of thing. So maybe year one, we probably wouldn't put deep lock into too much new oak. We'll have a little bit of new oak, maybe 10%. But the 90% of the wine is going to be in several year old oak, so that yep. we get the maturation, but not that not that 4 be 2 in the back of the head. Mm. Um, I work with a winemaker, John Glatzer, who's still one of my favourite people in the world. Bad teeth, typical winemaker. But, um, <laughs> um, but Johnny used to, and he was a smoker, which I liked, you know, not too prissy about things and stuff. But, uh, and, um, but John used to say he got up, he was famous for getting up at a conference that was running behind time. And he stood up and he was supposed to give a talk and he got up and said, no wood, no good, right? That'll be lunch, we're back on time, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's always one of those classic comments. But I think since those old days where you know Australian wines did have a couple of 4B2s in them often, mm. uh, I think the oak is really handled uh, so, carefully these days. So um, what's the, what's the D-Block retailing for? Uh, $55 is what I would recommend. Which, which, although that comes up in price from the Red Knot sort of thing, if you look at that on a world scale, oh, for the wine of that sort of quality, it's it's really good value. And um, so somebody's winning a top of the range bottle of wine just by throwing a comment yeah. out. It's a pretty good show, this one, isn't it? And we've got uh, Christian Hansen. The duck looks amazing. I'm keen to head down and try it with the d Well, all you got to, well, mate, all you got to do now is um, you got yourself a bottle of d Well, you're halfway there. All you got to do is give the uh, cellar door a call, ring up, maybe come down. Bring the, I know the wife will like to come down. And um, book yourselves in. Jerry will look after the kids. And uh, you can have a nice little uh, night for, or afternoon for two. Tony, where does the oak come from? And is it aged before you get it? Not a bad question. Not a bad question at all. Look, the oak is a fascinating... So the coopers are much like winemakers. Um, they seek out specific trees from forests. Um, it's about the how fast the oak tree grows, so as well as where it's grown. Um, there's two main types of oak generally used, and that's the French species of oak yeah. and then American species. And they both make great barrels. Um, originally, American oak got a bit of a bad rap because they were made by bourbon cooperages and they charred it and they did all sorts of things. But often our American oak is coopered in France or, and things, and, so, and it can be just as elegant as French oak. This, in, in saying that, with the D block, a little bit more French oak than, than American. French oak tends to be a little more structured and cedary, and American oak a little sweeter and, and uh, maybe a little caramel sort of coming through sometimes and things. Um, so we use a combination with the Shiraz. I still like a little bit of American oak there. There are winemakers out there that will use nothing but French oak and that sort of thing. French oak barrel costs more than American oak barrel, but that's to do with how it's produced. There's more, more trees in America than France. There's wastage. A French oak has to be split um, very carefully because of the nature of the tree, whereas American oak can be sawn. So there's less wastage out of each tree. Stupid question so, for you. Hang on, we've got a question on that. On the you can have your question in a sec because we don't really get that many questions. Yep. So, do you still do the gate? Absolutely. Someone that drank the 2005, a lovely vintage. Um, yeah. Yes, no, we've been doing the gate since I think uh, going back to 2002, virtually 2000. Um, so, yes, we do. The 17, oh, there we go, that's a 12. So, but the 17 wine picked up oh, several trophies over the last few years. Um, and Just the gate, at... it's interesting style in that the D block will not come, it probably, the gate will often win medals quite young and it's made in a little bit more old fashioned but very, very um, rich and, and bold style and luscious through the palate. Whereas the D block as a young wine is quite tight and linear and it needs time to come into its own. So it's, a, you know, even out of the same estate, we're creating wines with very different personalities. This is kind of a little more, a little more bold, a little more loud and things, um, more American oak here. 
tighter, a little more, uh, just a little more reserved, and and he's going to live for a long, long time. More French oak, various things. There, so, so, what would what would the uh, cellar life be of the D block compared to the gate? Do you reckon the D block would? They're both going to sell it well, but they will. Um, look, I, you know, the reality. It, it, it's it, sometimes aging wines is about what you like personally, and yeah. and I still like to see quite bright fruit in my wine. So, so often I'll, you know, I think McLaren Vale reds between about, you know, Shiraz come between about five and eight years of age is is schmick in that they've they've softened a little bit, but they're still vibrant. The reality is, if they're selling well, though, they're still going to be drinking well in twenty years' time and that sort of thing. Um, Let's just fire up. Yeah. Um, we've got Corey Allen. Um, with the food so infused by wine, would it show up in that alcohol test? <laughs> no. Well, you're not losing horse, your horse. <laughs> you would not lose your driver's license from the food. It's only from the glass because most of the wine has been cooked. And if you cook it up to what is it, 75, 76, alcohol will disappear. And quite often for reduction, depends on the amount I need, I use a small or a large frying pan. And if you have a shallow frying pan with a lot of surface, the oxygen lets uh, alcohol disappear. So, so keep, the answer would, I can answer that question now. Now horses, sorry. <laughs> the answer would be no, because the alcohol, obviously, is um, once it's been infused, not, it's pretty much not gone. Like it's, it's no, no, not like It's cooked soup. off with the heat, the yeah. alcohol, when it's done. And and you see that when people flambe something or you know they splash a brandy in the pan and it flames up, that's the alcohol burning off, and the chef will burn off the yeah. alcohol as part of the cooking. Uh, so the gate is that the top? Is that the top of the range? No, no. Um, it, we What's have, the top of the range? Well, D block really. The uned, we have a wine called Unedited, and um, that started off as part of a project here in McLaren Vale where we were making these um, wines that were just from a few rows of vines on your estate. We wanted that wine, low, low oak, so put into older oak, not too much oak influence. And we wanted to be an absolute expression of your dirt, of your terroir. Um, it was a great thing that we did for about, uh, since uh, 2009 was the first vintage and the last one under the project was 16. Um, it, it was, we did a Shiraz trail, so we released these quite young and people could then go from cellar door to cellar door and try these unique Shirazes and, and know where the dirt is and look on the map where it's from and that sort of thing. Um, so we've continued doing that and we just pick out a very special little parcel from uh, just a, a few rows in the vineyard and that's the unedited small make. D block is really the vine that sits sort of just below the unedited, but yeah. in reality it's um, it's probably really our, our lead wine. And it's, it's what, a, what's the um, cost of the gate? The, the gate's um, about $39, I think, so it's pretty good cool, value cool, as well. Um, yeah. and, um, $39. So I, no wonder the CEO. And we had to put that up. It was 35 We decided that it was... After it won about five trophies the other year, and uh, we had... You've nothing to see. We, they, the guys did a back medal with gold medals, and it's just sort of covered, so... Um, so look, these are wines that, that really do get great ratings from, from Halliday, from wine writers, from, from the wine show system, and we think they're exceptional values. So, and, oh, they are. You know, on, and honestly, one of these wines will get you a race with the boss, it will. So, you know, yeah? Yeah, I guarantee it. So, you know, um, two, two, might get you a, two might get you a new position. Well, we'll get you. <laughs> See, I am the boss. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, there you go. Oh, I'm waiting for someone to... Oh, give. Then you need to give it to Ange. Oh, right. <laughs> true. Any man who thinks his boss is kidding himself, you reckon? <laughs> so, um, I can't believe that. That's, that's a great price. I think you, they're going to come down to sell the door and, and check it out. Get, the D, get a bottle of D-Block, get a bottle of Gate, and um, make your own mind up of... I'd better. love to so, see, see what that's doing in, in four years. That's, that's going to be an absolute... I mean, it already is, but that in four years is going to be something really, really, really special. You get, you get something yourself? Mm, yeah. yeah. It's one of those great things in McLaren Vale, that the wines will be approachable at relatively young ages, yeah. but they will also live for a long time. Yeah. Um, you know, if you said, for example, a great Coonawarra Cabernet, it's probably not going to drink well at two or three years of age. It's going to need five, six, seven or more to soften out and things. Um, but McLaren Vale just has this natural generosity and rich, vibrant mid-palate fruit, which, which seems to carry the wines through. Um, Why is that? Look, I think it's our position. You know, yep. our vineyard sits between the hills to the east and the, and the beautiful 
Mediterranean's um, Gulf to the west, and it's that cooling influence. Yeah. Um, we have a, a warmish spring, so we get good growth away early, and we have a tempered summer. You know, when it's uh, when it's 42 degrees in the Barossa, it's a mere 38 here or 39 or something. So, and, and that makes a difference. It does make a difference, yeah. yeah. And as we're starting to see, you know, it's part of the. Look, I'm not smart enough to know whether it's global warming or not. All I know is that we're seeing more heat spikes and those heat spikes, you know, I don't remember when I was a kid ever seeing 46 on the no, temperature gauge. And, but I remember driving my car not long ago and thinking the temperature thing was broken. I kept banging because it said 46. I thought, can't be. You know, you watch the news that night and you think, yeah, it was. So. Yeah. Um, but we really have got, I think we're learning a lot of managing the vineyards through some of these uh, um, change conditions. Um, Water is important. We don't dry grow on our block. Our soils are quite tough, yeah. and without some additional, without some additional irrigation, we'd find that uh, we'd struggle to get the quality we do. So we use water here as a tool to produce quality, not quantity. Yeah, uh, very important. And we're also sustainable. McLaren Vale. We brought in recycled water into McLaren Vale when this wasn't popular maybe 20 years ago. And it's been one of the saving graces of McLaren Vale, and it's helped preserve our underground water resources, and it's helped people manage going into these warmer times. So. How do you see 2020 going at the moment with the, the amount of rain we've had? Look, great. It, 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 we love to. There's nothing. Look, I'm a farmer. I love rain. Yeah. Yeah. If you ever see a farmer complaining about rain, he, uh, he, he, needs, he needs a new occupation. You, so. don't, you don't hear from him when it's raining. No, that's right. So, so look, it, it, we love the, the wet winters because it helps um, remove the salt from the soil uh, and you can imagine that salt can build up in the soil over time and things so that winter rain flushes the soil and there's nothing like real rainfall you know rainfall is much better than irrigating in terms of the vines the vines know the difference they just love yeah. that rainfall and, and we'll see I think we'll, from this we're going to see a great spring and, and possibly a really good vintage yeah. you know, it's boating well so far yeah great horse you're out thank you very much for coming back into the centre uh, the dessert is almost ready to go, maybe with a fortified Shiraz. All right. Um, first, I'd like to do some burning. Not bridges, but caramel. So we do all every kind of Shiraz. We do sparkling Shiraz, we do Shiraz table wine, and we do a fortified Shiraz. We're not allowed to call it port anymore. No, I get to trouble for that. Sorry, I didn't say that. But, um, yeah, you got the wrong guy. <laughs> so what are we doing here, horse? So we have the Shiraz Creme Brulee. Oh, oh. And the Shiraz Parfait, which is an ice cream. Except if you get an American lawyer in, he gets me because it's not an ice cream because it's not made in an ice cream machine. It's, it's a frozen parfait. <laughs> and then we have chocolate ganache. Of course, there's also a little bit of Shiraz reduction involved. And then we have our chocolate mousse. Sorry, I'm just getting in early. And I'm a chocolate guy. This is, this is, this heaven. is, this this is, is heaven for me. Oh. I'm a chocolate dessert guy from way back. So this, is to, this is absolute torture. Have a look at how that's glistening. I know. <laughs> It's got a little trick there. It might be the wine. Right. Might be the wine, I reckon. Well, or I have done function with 500 people, and then you can't do knells with two spoons. It takes forever. So you need to learn to yeah. do it in one go. And in case you have some finger marks on your plate, you always cover this up with a little bit of chocolate dust. Okay. Ah. And here you have your Shiraz and chocolate. Uh, Please enjoy. Standing. Thank you. Actual tears. Yeah. If you're ever going to take a photo of food, I mean, look at that. Hey, let, let's move this so Jerry can get a great shot of it. That's um, that something else. Look at that. You got to send people home happy. Oh, it's it's always so important. So. And um, obviously, he's found many a ways to infuse the wine into the dessert as well. So t tell me about this, um, we won't call it port, we'll call it vintage fortified Shiraz. Vintage fortified, liqueur Shiraz, whatever you like to say. Yeah. So, um, yeah look, we, we, funnily enough, with the sparkling Shiraz, we, we used to make 
some fortified Shiraz as a uh, uh, liqueuring um, agent, sort of with the fortified. We actually put about two percent of fortified Shiraz into the wine with the, the sparkling Shiraz. So we were making a little bit for that anyway. Um, and 2012, really, the wine was stunning. So we did a little bit of bottling then. And we only do this every every few years uh, when we need to. Um, did a 16, did an 18. The 18's been winning a heap of gold medals, which is really interesting, the wine shows, and I think it takes people a bit by surprise when they see what it is and things. But, but we're not trying to make a Portuguese style. Um, Portuguese style would be drier um, and probably lower, uh, higher alcohol. Um, here we're really looking for that lovely, luscious, ripe Shiraz. The alcohol's about 18.5%, uh, 18, 18, 18 so just enough to, to preserve it the sugar that's there. So with a four, with a, with one of these wines, we're basically bringing it in, we're fermenting it like a red wine, it comes in quite ripe, and then at a point we decide where we stop the ferment, and we add the, we add the spirit, um, which is just a very clean spirit, we don't use a brandy spirit with this, we use a very clean spirit. We add in the spirit, we chill it, and we stop the ferment so that the sugar is preserved that's there. Um, Quite sweet. Um, there's something like about 100 and 150 grams, 160 grams per liter of sugar in this, so it is quite sweet. But mm. it's balanced with the acidity and the tannin, and it doesn't cloy. Um, I always seek this, you know, as much as it works great. Like sitting around a campfire with friends with a couple of bottles of this, you can't go wrong on a night with a uh, cool night and things. It just works really well. Um, Come on, mate. What's the what's the light? what's the <laughs> you haven't stopped smiling all night. Have you? you haven't been able to talk because you've been smiling all night. That is time. insane. That is insane. I, I cracked. I, I didn't know what I was getting there. I was sort of. A creme brulee. Yeah, yeah well, but it was. I, I've never had. Um, you never had a. One of this colour, no. Oh, well, no, because no. you haven't had a yeah. wine infused. Is it Shiraz infused? Yes. Yes. Um, and I thought, when I, when I had that one, I thought, that is my favourite of the night. Then I went into here. Uh, what have we got here? This is not, uh, what do we call it? Chocolate mousse. Right, okay. Mousse or chocolate. chocolate. Okay. And it's so refined. You know, uh, the, something that's come out with the wine and the food is there, the balance there, it just hasn't gone over the top. And it's, that's exemplary. And then, I think this is my number one though. Uh -huh. I, I kind of moved through it all one by one and I was going, this is gold, this is gold, this is gold. Thank I went you, over man. there and then I was like, oh, hello. Good to hear. I'm feeding on your feedback. Yeah. It's, uh, the mousse is so creamy. Oh. And just, so it's just, and what's just your favourite, John, out of the dessert plate? Um, I still like the... I, yeah. like the, I just love the crunch in this. Oh, yeah, there. Yeah. It's all good. Um, um, uh, it's, it's not really... I guess it's, there's not really fruit. There's a tiny bit there with it. I didn't mean to spoil putting too much fruit with it. But, no. Um, <laughs> So look, I, I, I think it's all great, but I, I, I think this is great, but no, probably for me the chocolate is. Mm. So. Yeah. But sometimes with a, a dessert, just too sweet, I, I kind of just said, oh, that's too, that there, the balance that you've got there, and uh, with the fortified um, Shiraz, it's... it's so what's your, what's your take on the fortified? It's, that is fabulous. Are you, uh, are again, you, are you usually again, a fortified man? I am. I, yeah, do, like so yeah, right. I, do, I do like my fortified wine. So, um, no, that's the alcohol doesn't poke out. No, it's very really soft. And on the tongue, when it first comes in, it's just... Sometimes it's, it's, it's a different to it. It's, oh, let me just have a... It's a very Aussie style. Look, it's, you know, it's, it's a unique thing that we do here with these sorts of fortifieds. So. It's, it's just, when it gets on the tongue straight away, it's just so fruity and... Yeah, it's not a alcohol type taste, it's just a very fruity taste and it just goes so well. What my, my, my old man is just the, um, loves his fortifieds and loves his ports, he, as he would say, so uh, might have to grab it on the way out. Yeah, that's pretty special. Getting the good book, sure. Yeah, like yeah. Be in the good book. Probably be a waste for him, really. But. <laughs> I was very lucky to go through um, Roseworthy Winemaking School with um, uh, probably Portugal's greatest uh, Fortified winemaker uh, Dave Gimmerans, and so making a fortified. Although he would, he would be, he would have something to say about this, and to be too sweet, and there'd be all sorts yeah. of things. But um, but we make our style. But they really are great wines. Those those Portuguese ports are just something special. So right? is and Portugal they age known so long. for their like if, 
Yes, yeah. Porto is port. So port comes from Porto in, in Portugal. Right. Um, I've been talking about fortified that. And um, that's right. Yeah. Just, <laughs> just that's out right. Of it. So, and, and it's it's the, well, the factory house is this sort of uh, place where all the port lodge guys go and, uh, and and eat and things, and it's an amazing experience. Uh, it's just well, a fa fabulous country. I, and it takes right off. It, well, yes, that's right. Oh, no, no, of course not. Sorry, I didn't say the, um, but Portugal is one of those countries that, that you know you get on a tram and people look you in the eye and smile and it's not like that around the world in a lot of places these days they've still got that Australian friendliness and and they're happy to smile and chat and you know great country really is. Oh, so we just got to uh, remind people that they, they get a chance to win the bottle geez some people have cleaned up tonight with some pretty good bottles of wine haven't they yeah. good show this yeah. one if yeah. you want to, want to win a bottle of wine you can do is comment so, um, and we thank uh, Shinglebat very much as well for uh, supplying the wine to um, the winners. So fire a question away if you've got a question for Horse about his, how he's made such an amazing meal and infused the wine would be a great. I'm going to have to come back. I'm, yeah. I'm going to have to come back. I'll bring the wife. And, a little um, bit of acidity here is really important, I think, isn't it? You sort of look at this, it's, it's really clean, the flavours, and it's just, you don't, it doesn't appear sweet on the palate, it's just, just luscious, but that, the, the, I'm no foodie, but the balance, the, you, it's just balanced refinement, and it's just not that, it doesn't hit you and just go, ugh, that, I could eat that again and again and again and again and again. That's yeah, well, thanks, mate, thanks. Yeah, sorry. Now you've done well. You've said bugger all. You've eaten all night and uh, have had the best meal of your life and drank amazing wine. But you so could yeah. be a winemaker. You'd <laughs> you could fit right in. You'd fit right in. It's all good. Wouldn't you? <laughs> I don't know if you'd give up running the tours though, would you? No. That's pretty much the dream job, isn't it? Not when I so, can do this. Not when you can do <laughs> no, Yeah, true. So um, you'd have to get a tour to come through. Mm. I'll say, um, electric bikes, and this is not just on my tours, if, um, if people are getting off the train line at Seaford, get on your bikes, get on the, uh, you're about 25 minutes, 30 minutes, and it's a gorgeous ride. Absolutely I've gorgeous. cut it out there. And it's safe too, too on yeah. the bike paths, yeah. you know. So. And this is the first one you come to. Um, and now it doesn't matter if it's summer or winter, but at the moment in winter, as I say, when you can smell that, that fire burning, come let's, in here, cosy. Let's, um, why don't you answer Sharon's um, question because you haven't done much else. She's a winner. Ah, oh, she's a winner. Go for it. Okay, so am I, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, so was it a complete meal package if you book if you book three to four courses? I can imagine quite a few people I know happy with <laughs> just the dessert sitting. Um, yeah, I I can't imagine anyone not enjoying that dessert. That, that was no, you got to go through the whole lot though. Yeah, but you, that, just you do. Experience. For me, the, the two that stood out. I mean, they're all fantastic. That the fish and the finish here. Uh, th they were my two that just went whack, whack, whack. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it was all, that's, as a meal, one of the best meals I've ever had in my life. Thank yeah. you. That was a, and that's not trying to suck up the shit. That nice, was nice, to, nice to hear. Yeah. And again, it's about balance. The yeah. flavor, it flows through the courses, yeah. the flavors and, and, you know, through the desserts. I think I have a bit of an advantage here. Not only that I cook this wine and infuse a lot, it is also that I can build the menu from the beginning, as you just have described, the flavor profile builds up from the first course or the second, the third, and the dessert. If you have an a la carte menu, you might have a heavy spice starter, garlic prawns, chili, whatever. And then I ask myself, what can you do to build up on that one? But I have here the opportunity to have a four course meal designed for wine. So I start relatively gentle, but with aroma, and then I add on more flavor in each course. And those little bangs that you have, like with the grapes, when you eat one of those grapes, and you just go, "Wow, that's I've never had a grape that tasted like that." that was... I think the difference is a, the reduction. The reduction can be you can you can just have something sitting in your wine, like the uh, mandarin. There's, there's not much reduction on going there, but if you wanted to have color and intensify, you reduce wine. And if you reduce it by half, then well, the level of acidity goes up. You get some moments going, but if you wanted to make a parfait, for example, or the uh, um, uh, creme brulee. I use a normal creme brulee recipe, which is normally made with cream. Some people use half cream, half milk, and egg yolk. Uh, but I use the same re base recipe, but replace half of the uh, cream with a Shiraz reduction. And I reduce for the for this in particular uh, um, dish quite a lot because I don't want to have much 
liquid, I want it to have the intensity and the color. Yeah. That's very That's wonderful. Well, unfortunately for you guys, I think we're about coming to an end and I've got a chat about who's on next week. So we've got Scott from Rusty Mutts and um, we're going to be live from Jones Pantry. And uh, Jones Pantry is, um, as you're coming through, um, I think it's, Cor is it Coromandel Valley? I think so. Yeah, Coromandel Valley. Right near, so there's a little oval and it's just on the left there. It's been there forever and um, it's recently been done up. And it's absolutely thriving. And I went to a wine just night. Glen Alta, I think, sort of the sub between Glen Alta, Blair, and yeah, yeah, just yeah. yeah, as you go on the back way through yeah. um, to Stirling. So um, we'll, we'll be up there, and um, there's also we've got a special offer from everyone who's been watching or watches um, later. Is you can use a special promo code to receive 25 25 percent off your next wine purchase through the website. So the um, special promo is Mates Rates. So make sure you go to Shiggleback's website, put in your special 25%, it's, we've already been talking all night, it's too cheap. Yeah, it's, right. it's a competitive industry. So once again, what a great special offer for um, the people watching the show. And um, jump on the website, order it up, it's already cheap and you're gonna get, I'd be going and um, getting some, the D block. Yeah. And I'd be getting some gate. I'd be just getting a whole lot. Fortified, and I'd love, I'd, love to, I'd love to try that gate. So that's the one I reckon I'd be um, and and the rosé. The seventeen finished at the gate at the moment. It picked up a bag of trophies and gold medals. So all right, really well. All right, so I've got to say, oh, let's come back in here. We've got to say thanks to you. I've got to say thanks very much, mate. You have outdone yourself. I've learned so much. I'm sure the um, viewers have as well. Luke's had a lot night of his life. He's going to be talk, talking them up as one of the best meals in his whole life. That's so right. um, you've totally outdone yourself and anybody watching has got a book. Give the, give the um, seller door a call, book in, get this amazing experience. It wouldn't be that many spare spots, would there? And they'd go pretty quick. So is it hard to get it? are being fairly full well, lately. Yes, about it, so. in particular the Sunday seating is, is usually uh, booked up in advance. Uh, yep. But again, just call the sell out of people, we, we do what we can. Yeah, excellent. They're accommodating. And so I've got to thank you too, John. Thank um, you, thank you but, for the chance to talk to people oh, about yeah. our wines and, and our experience here at Shingleback. It's been so easy, we've learnt so much, and especially what goes, I never knew so much when into making Chardonnay or so much money to ma making rosé. And then for the fact that it's 12 bucks a bottle, it's kind of seems um, probably worth it, the amount of effort that goes into it. But thanks very much, we've all learned a lot. It's been a great show. Thanks for watching guys, and tune in next week. We'll be back on live at seven o'clock from Jones Pantry with the uh, boys from Rusty Mutt. So thanks again for watching. Seven o'clock next week, live on YouTube and Facebook. Thanks Luke. Cheers. Cheers.